Good morning, good morning, church. Hope everyone's doing well today. We're going to be in Genesis, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. We're going to be continuing the Jacob teaching series. I invite you to please turn to your Bibles in Genesis chapter 32. We'll please scan the CPAC in front of you and you can follow along on the Bible reading app. Follow along on the Bible uh, reading app. So um, I just wanted to open up really quick. I wanted to share something with you guys. I feel like we have that kind of relationship. I had a cool dad moment this past week. Um, there gets these points, and I'm sure all the parents in the room can, can attest to this. Uh, there gets to a point in a child's life where they start to do certain things, and they develop their imagination and their playfulness, and they start to identify with who they are, and their personalities really start to come out. And... Um, the boys, they had like these like cloth things that they were playing with, um, that they were playing with. And so, uh, they, they, for the very first time, they came up to me and they wanted, it, they wanted it tied around their shoulders. They wanted it tied around their shoulders, almost like a cape. Almost like a cape. And so, it was really interesting because they've never done that before. They never really like pretended to be somebody or something. And it was interesting because they thought they, you know, they were superheroes. That they could fly, that they could jump, they could do anything because they had this cape on. And I remember in my, my young life, I remember a similar experience of putting that cape on. Everybody, everybody knows that when you put that cape on, they feel like you're just a superhero and you could do pretty much anything. Amen? No, I'm the only one. Okay, and amen. And no, no one feels like they're a superhero when they put that cape on. I mean, I still do it from time to time. Um, you know, it's, I'm not a very popular person around the house when I put my cape on. But the boys love it, and that's all I care about. Um, and so they did that, and I'm like, man, that, that's, that's really cool. They've never done that before, and it's cool to see their personalities come about and stuff. Anyway, just a cool dad moment I wanted to... Share with you guys as we jump into this text. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. It says this, Jacob went on his way and God's angels met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's camp. So he called the place Mahamea. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the territory of Edom. He commanded them, you are to say, my Lord Esau. This is what your servant Jacob says. I have been staying with the Laban, and I have been delayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female slaves. I have sent this message to inform my Lord in order to seek your favor. Verse 6 says, when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we want uh, we went to your brother Esau. He is coming to meet you. He is coming to meet you. And he has 400 men with him. Verse 7 says, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people with him into two camps along with the flocks and herds and camels. He thought if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, the remaining one can escape. We're just going to pause for just a moment. And let's just break this down a little bit. So when I was studying for this text in particular, at this junction in Jacob's life, I feel like we have to look at his life as an entirety up until this point. You see, Jacob was born from Isaac, his father. Jacob was one of the patriarchs of the Bible, meaning he's the one at the end of the name of God is the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's an important biblical figure. And that's pretty much all we know about Jacob. And then we find out later on when Jacob is young, his brother Esau, the firstborn, had what is called a birthright, which means everything that is his father's is inherently his because he is the firstborn. And so Esau came home from hunting one day, and we find out that Jacob actually stole Esau's birthright, or rather Esau sold it to Jacob. For a bowl of stew. Esau came back. He was hungry. Jacob had stew. And he's like, give me a birthright and I'll give you stew. And Esau says to Jacob, what good is my birthright if I'm starving? Sure, you can have it. And he gives it to Esau. 
And Jacob tricked Esau into giving his birthright. Later in Jacob's life, Isaac, his father, becomes old, and he develops a sense of blindness. And he tells Esau, go and hunt for wild game, just like I love that you do, and prepare my favorite dish for me. When you get back, I will bless you. I will bless you. And so Esau goes and he goes hunting. Rebecca, Jacob's mom, who loves Jacob more than Esau, tells Jacob this, and they come up with this scheme to steal the blessing from his father. They cover the smooth parts of his skin with goat's fur because Esau was very hairy. They put Esau's clothes on Jacob. Rebecca prepares um, uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac's favorite dish for Jacob to go present to Isaac. Jacob does that. Isaac blesses him, thinking him, thinking that it is Esau. And then Esau arrives home and does just as his father asked him to do. He walks in the room and Isaac starts shaking uncontrollably. He's like, who are you? He's like, I'm Esau. He's like, no, you were just here. I just blessed you. That was actually Jacob. He stole his brother's birthright and his father's blessing. Esau was so distraught and upset. He's begging his father, father, don't you have just one more blessing for me? And Isaac says, no. You have served your brother. He has stolen your blessing along with your birthright. Esau gets so mad at Jacob, so mad that he says, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill my brother the next time I see him. And Rebecca hears this and he goes and tells Jacob, you need to flee. You need to go live with your uncle Laban. Far away from here. Flee from your brother. He is trying to kill you. And so... Jacob gets up and leaves, and he travels halfway to Laban, in this faraway land, far from his brother, and he lays his head down to sleep. And when he falls asleep, we find this in Genesis chapter 28, he has an encounter with God. He has an encounter with God. He sees angels, he sees the Lord standing at the top of stairs. And when he awakes, he says something. Something important. Something that we may not have deduced if we don't look back. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 20, it says, Then Jacob made a vow. This is after he awoke. If God will be with me and watch over me, during this journey I'm making, if I return safely to my, my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. If I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. This is inferring that Jacob didn't seemingly have a personal relationship with God. This is inferring that God, he understood who God was. The covenant that he made with his father Isaac, the covenant that he made with his father Abraham, he had religious practice. He understood what he should do and what he was supposed to do. He had his family's faith. But halfway to the journey to his uncle Laban, we find that he admitted something. We find that he says, if God does this, if God gives him a safe return to his father's family, then the Lord will be my God. Inferring, the Lord is not. Jacob doesn't have a personal relationship with God. He knows of God, he knows what he does, but he doesn't identify as one of God's children. He doesn't identify with who God says he is. And so Jacob finishes his journey. He goes and lives with his uncle Laban. He marries his first wife, Leah, who he was tricked into marrying, and then his second wife, Rachel, and had 12 sons and some daughters, and then tricked his uncle Laban into everything he had, took all of his fortune and ran away. He fleed Laban. He said, I'm going back to my father's land because God has told me to go to my father's land. In fact, the God of my father told me to go. And so he's halfway back, back at the place where he had that encounter with God. He's returning to where he had that encounter with God on the way to visit Laban in Genesis chapter 32. 
And we see that through all of that, he had multiple encounters with God. He has been become very prosperous in the land that he was sent to, to live with his uncle Laban. And we know because of what he has said and the way he has carried himself through Genesis 28 and 29 and 30 and 31, as we've heard time and time again over the last several weeks, that Jacob does not necessarily have a personal relationship with God. He understands who God is, but he doesn't identify as someone who is in a right standing or in a relationship with God the Father. He identifies with God and calls him the God of my father. Not my God, the God of my father. And so when we pick up in Genesis chapter 32, and he's making his way back to the land of his family, we see a couple of things happening. We see a man in an identity crisis. Jacob, he's distressed, he's afraid, he's fearful. He fleed from persecution from his brother. He fleed from Laban. He schemed, he's cheated his way through all of life. And now he's heading back to his family's land. Emotionally distressed, upset, identifying with all of his wrongdoings that he's ever done in his life. He sees that God is the God of his father and the father, uh, he is also the God of his father's father, Abraham. But he doesn't identify God as his father. He doesn't identify of who God has called him to be and who he says he is. He sees himself as all the wrongdoings he's done in life. You see, his brother Esau wanted to kill him. This was 20 somewhat years ago. Now he's returning back and he still thinks his brother is going to kill him. Jacob does, is doing the exact same thing that all of us do and have done. When someone said, what is your name and what do you do? Oftentimes we say, my name is so and so, my occupation is this. But in the back of our minds, we often say, I am my shortcomings, I am my debt, I am my addiction, I am my problem, I am my situation, I am my circumstance. Jacob's returning home, feeling the same weight. I am the one who cheated my brother. I am the one who has schemed with my mother to steal this blessing from my father. I am the one who is tricked to marry Leah and Rachel and had 12 sons. And I am the one who tricked Uncle Laban out of everything he owns. Everything he's worked for. Was Laban a great guy? No, but still. Jacob is identifying and stressing to the max because of his actions. He's identifying himself with what he has done rather than who God sees him to be. He's had encounters with God, yet he still identifies with his shortcomings. Verse 10, sorry, verse 9 says... Then Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac. This solidifies the point that I was alluding to and trying to make earlier that he doesn't identify as God, his God. He identified and, and, and says right here very clearly in verse 9 that um, Verse 9, that it is the God of his father Isaac and the God of his father Abraham. He's not, he doesn't have a personal relationship with God. And so he's facing persecution. He's distressed from the situation. He's going back. He knows he has to face his brother Esau. And so what does he do? He sends messengers up ahead and he says, go see my brother Esau and tell him I'm coming to see him. And the messengers return and they say, Esau said, he's coming to see you. He's not waiting for you to arrive. He's coming to see you and he's bringing 400 men. And the only thing Jacob knows to do is to start to panic. And so he splits his camp and he puts one camp in between him and his brother and himself. So now they're in two camps, two separate camps. His thinking is, if Esau comes and he destroys the first camp, it'll give me time to escape. And like many of us do, when we're struggling with a sense of identity or a sense of faith, 
We plead with God. The night comes and in verse 9 it says, Then Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Go back to your land and to your family and I will cause you to prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Indeed, I crossed over the Jordan with my staff and now I have become two camps. Please rescue me from my brother Esau. For I am afraid of him, otherwise he may come and attack me. The mothers and their children, you have said I will cause you to prosper and I will make your offspring like the sand of the sea too numerous to count. He's quoting back the very covenant that God made with his father and his father's father. He understands what God said he would do, but he has not internalized it. He has not said God is going to do it through me. He's pleading with God out of situation and circumstance and identifying with everything that he has done wrong out of desperation, distress, anxiety. Verse 13 says he spent the night there and took part of what he brought with him as a gift to his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200... uh, he was 20 rams, 30 uh, milk camels with their young, 40 cows, then 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He entrusted them to his slaves as separate herds and said to them, Go on ahead of me and leave some distance between the herds. And he told the first one, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, Who do you belong to? Where are you going? And whose animals are these ahead of you? Then tell him, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau. And look, he is behind us. Verse 19 says, He also told the second one, the third, and everyone who was walking behind the animals, say the same thing to Esau. When you find him, you are also to say, Look, your servant Jacob is right behind us. For he thought, I want to appease Esau with the gift that is going ahead of me. After that, I can face him and perhaps he will forgive me. Jacob is sending these herds out. He's separating the camps even further to create even an additional degree of separation from the situation and circumstance he's facing, which is his brother, and separating the herds and creating distance. So when Esau comes to meet Jacob, they can tell him every step along the way, this is for you, my Lord. Jacob is positioning himself in his word choice below his brother. Notice that the word Lord is lowercase, meaning it doesn't have a, an eternal sense. It's a worldly humbling. Your servant Jacob, Lord Esau, please accept my gift and please forgive me. So let's just take a moment and rewind. Jacob is faced with a serious situation. He's emotionally distressed, identifying with everything he's ever done wrong in his life, having an identity crisis. He splits the two camps because he wants to protect himself. And then he pleads with God, God, please protect me from my brother Esau. Please, you have made promises to my father and his father. You've done that. Please just protect me. And the anxiety and distress of Jacob gets the betterment of him again. And rather than relying on faith after praying to God, in fact, this is the first recorded prayer to God of Jacob's life in the book of Genesis, he decides, I'm going to split the camps again and separate the herd so there's even greater distance between me and my brother. And I'm going to tell every single herd that Esau encounters along the way to me that this is for you. This is a gift to you. Please forgive me. The story continues, verse 21. So the gift was sent on ahead of them. He sent, a, he sent a gift out ahead of them while he remained in the camp that night. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two slave women, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Chabok. Uh, he took them and sent them across the stream along with all of his possessions again, separating himself even more from Esau. Verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. 
Then he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Verse 27 says, what is your name, the man asked. Jacob replied, your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. All of these events have happened in Jacob's life. Causing immense amount of distress and anxiety and identification with everything he's ever done wrong. Where he's just gone through life struggling. Not identifying with what God sees him to be and the potential he has. He has multiple encounters with God. And what does Jacob do? He says, if God does something, then I will turn my life to him. How many of us have ever done that in our own lives? Where we give God a sense of ultimatum where we say, if God does this, then I will serve him. If God saves me, if God heals this person, if God provides, then I will serve him with everything I have. And finally identify with what he is going to do. Jacob was in a position unlike any one of us where his father and father's father had face-to-face relationships with God and made a covenant promise with them. That their descendants would multiply and populate the earth and eventually Jesus Christ himself would come through their lineage. The promise is going to be upheld through the life of Jacob. But he doesn't identify with that. That's my father's faith. The only thing I am is all of the difficulty I've had to face in my life. Only thing I can see is the distress and anxiety and difficulty that's in front of me. I plead with God, I give him an ultimatum and say, if you do this, then I will serve you. And then turn around and create degrees of separation in your own plan and place to try to circumvent what's going to happen. And so what happens? Jacob falls asleep. And this man starts wrestling him to the point where they wrestle until daybreak. And then the man dislocates Jacob's hip so he cannot walk. He can't escape. And then the man turns to Jacob and says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. And the man turns to him and says, no, your name is Israel. The man in this story, theologians would agree, is a representative of God himself. Whether it's it's an angel or Jesus, that's the point to be debated. But it's a representative of God himself. And when he turns to Jacob and asks him, what is your name? Jacob could have filled in the blank a million different ways. I'm a trickster. I've cheated my brother. I've cheated my father. I've cheated my uncle Laban. I have married Leah. I've married Rachel. I have done so many wrong things. I have an addiction to this. I I am this problem. I am the debt that I incur. I am my anxiety. I am my stress. And this representative of God in this wrestling match turns to Jacob and says, No, you're none of those things. You are Israel. You are who I say you are. Church, let that sink in for just a moment because we are not any of the things we identify ourselves as. We can take our own story and own narrative and just put it in Jacob's shoes for just a moment. We are who God says we are. We are not the anxiety and the stress. We're not an identity crisis. We are who God says we are. No matter how much difficulty we've faced in life, no matter how much struggle we've had to prevail, God sees us as his child. He sees us as a vessel to be used by him. His will is going to be done. Jacob operated under free will for the majority of his life. Doing all of these things. And then in his encounter with God, he says, no, you're none of that. You are Israel. You are who I say you are. My will is going to be done. The covenant will be fulfilled. Jacob turns to the man and says, who who are you? And the man just simply responds, do you need to ask? 
He recognizes the face. He's encountered God before. In fact, in this very place, when he was leaving his family and fleeing from his brother. So many of us go through life day to day, struggling with an identity crisis. We identify with everything we've done wrong. We identify as everything we have done wrong. We go through life relying on other people's faith and pleading with God and giving Him ultimatums. But it was at this point in Jacob's life where there was a turning point. A physical altercation with God. A physical altercation with God. With Jacob, finally, when God said, your name is not Jacob, it is Israel. You are who I say you are. I'm going to do in your life what I see fit. God doesn't have to use any of us in this story of life. It is a privilege and an honor to get to be used by Him. God doesn't see us as what we've done or the mistakes we've made. He sees you as His children. He's made a covenant promise with all of us. That is that Jesus went to the cross and died for all of our sins and there's a free hope of eternal grace that is available to all of us. And when we accept that free gift, we have eternal life. He sees us as His children. My mentor growing up, um, or one of them, I asked him, how does God see us? Does he see us as the mistakes? Does he see us blemished? Does he see us through a dirty window? Does he see everything we're going to do? Because we're obviously going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up. Does he view us as all the mistakes that we've already made? Does he have a tainted image of us just like I see myself? And he said, no, God sees you as perfect. When you, when you fall into a relationship with him and you accept him as Lord and Savior, he says, you are my child. This is your name. This is who I see you as. Accept it. Identify as it. You are a saint living, a saint amongst sinners. He sanctifies us. He makes us pure and holy. He sees us as the finished product. Are we going to mess up tomorrow? 100% guarantee. Is he still going to love us with abundant grace? Yes. Church, don't let it get to a point in your life where you have to have a physical altercation with God in order to identify with who He sees you as. Let today be the moment where you come before God and you say, Lord, I don't know who I am or what I'm called to do or where I'm supposed to be in this moment, but I know in this moment, today, in this room, that I don't, I don't want to have a physical altercation with you. I just want to know you. You can't know who God sees you as if you don't have a relationship with Him. And when God said to Jacob, your name is Israel, this turning point in his life, we'll see in the weeks to come, led to reconciliation and abundant grace and his children being used by God in, in good ways and in bad, but ultimately for his glory. Going back to that proud dad moment when my son put on that cape for the first time. It's so cool to see their imagination just run wild and they can be a superhero and do whatever they want. But man, was I excited to tell them that God sees them as much bigger than what they can imagine. They're not their names, they're who God says they are. They don't quite understand that point of the dynamic yet. But when they do, I hope and I pray that they hold on to that as tight as they possibly can. Knowing that there is no limits or bounds that God is going to use them. In spite of their failures, in spite of everything that they're going to face in life. Through God and through their relationship with Jesus Christ, they're going to prevail. After this altercation with God, Jacob walked away with a limp. I think that's kind of a reminder. He's been changed by God. Church, in just a moment, there's going to be an opportunity to respond. 
to this text and what God is saying to us. Ask yourselves, be honest. Am I having an identity crisis? Do I, de- do I identify with who God says I am? I know for me personally, it's been a struggle to lean into what God sees me as rather than the circumstances or situation I find myself in. God, I'm only as good as the difficulty around me and, and how I deal with it. No. He sees you and loves you so much more than that. Let this be a turning point just like it was for Jacob. Let God call you when he sees fit. Let your identity rest in Christ. Because who you are is who he says you are. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, we're so thankful for this text. We're so thankful for the ability we have to worship you. Lord, thank you for this reminder. Thank you for this illustration. Thank you for Jacob's life. Lord, perhaps there's somebody in this room who's in an identity crisis. They don't know who they are. Lord, I pray that they would lean on you. They would look to you to define who they are. Lord, perhaps there's some in this room that can't, don't know where to start in that conversation. They don't know who you are. Lord, I pray that you give them a sense of boldness and courage to not leave this place without having a conversation with myself or Pastor Mike or one of our elders or anybody standing in the back. They would not leave this place in an identity crisis. Lord, they would lean, they would press into the fact that we are who you say we are.